welcome to EuroPCR 2023. My name is Angela McInerney and I'm an interventional cardiologist from Galway University Hospital on the west coast of Ireland. And today I have the pleasure of being joined by Professor James Spratt, who needs no introduction, but is from St. George's Hospital in London. So welcome. Thanks, Angela. Nice to be here. So today we're going to talk about uh, lithotripsy and the five year journey to where we are today. So um, do you want to walk us through calcium modification over the last number of years and how that has evolved to where we are today? Sure. Well, it's interesting to, to look back five years because we had the same problem, but what we didn't have was any real understanding of what that was. And certainly what IVL have brought to the table is a deeper understanding of the problem. And also quite a bit, we're quite a bit the way forward of trying to understand the solution as well. So I think five years ago, we knew that calcium was a big problem, particularly in older patients. But actually the tools available to us were pretty limited. We had rota, we had cutting balloons, but if they didn't work and they weren't, didn't get us to where we needed to be, we really didn't have much many options beyond that. So I think lithotripsy has certainly changed that landscape dramatically. Uh, we can see that in certainly in terms of our understanding of disease, intervascular imaging has really changed that. And we're starting to see durable results in patients that actually we weren't that comfortable in treating before. I know you've got some insight into that yourself because you've actually published some data on that. And I'd be interested to explore that and see what did you see? What insights could we get from that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, I actually just presented some data, some new data on um, our use of uh, IVL in, in our current practice. And actually what we presented was a prospective multi-centre study, which I did when I was a, a fellow in Clinico San Carlos in Madrid. Okay. And we had 13 centres across Spain and uh, Italy. It was actually an OCT and IVL based study. We had a pre-specified OCT, pre-IVL, post-IVL and post-stenting. And what we looked at was the effect of IVL in different calcium morphologies. So what we divided our uh, population, which was 91 uh, patients, 93 lesions, into concentric calcification versus eccentric and nodular, which we put them together and looked at the effect of IVL. Okay. And really it's confirmative data because we do have some data coming out now on uh, the effect of IVL in different calcium morphologies. And what we also found is that while you have more calcium in concentric lesions, because of course they mm -hmm. are, are more calcified, um, you do also get more fracture in those lesions. Um, and the fractures are wider and deeper. However, when you look at their stent expansion in terms of minimum stent area mm. and stent expansion, there was no difference between those who had concentric calcification and those who had eccentric or nodular calcification. So I think that's confirmatory um, information in terms of what we're seeing coming out from Ziad Ali's group, for example. Right. Um, and I think it's really promising um, uh, data coming out from it, the use of IVL in different calcium morphologies. Uh, uh, and you know, you pushed that, that point to me at the start, Angela, what's changed? Hmm. And I guess if you asked our colleagues five years ago, what's the biggest problem? They'd all have said concentric calcium, yeah. just can't apply enough force to fracture the calcium. Do you think that's where we are today? Um, with, as in terms of a problem with concentric Yeah, in terms calcium. of the problem, what, what, yeah. is the, what is the biggest problem of calcium we're currently trying to solve? I think probably the biggest problem that we're trying to solve right now, because IVL has solved a number of our, our, our issues um, in terms of calcium modification, particularly in concentric calcification. Nodular calcification is still something that poses some difficulties to us. Um, again, there was a recent publication in Jack actually, um, only last week or the week before, looking at the effect of IVL in nodular calcification. And again, similar to our study, they found um, no difference in stent expansion across those different types of calcium morphologies. Um, so I think nodular calcification do, does still pose an issue for us, but we're certainly um, uh, coming to the point where we have some viable solutions. Are you finding that in your practice? Well, certainly what we've seen with eccentric calcium is that previously when you didn't get a good result with a balloon or for whatever reason you couldn't use rota, say wire bias, for example, there wasn't really anywhere to go because mm. if you kept pushing that envelope, Unfortunately, you get a problem like a perforation and nobody wants that. We want patients to get durable outcomes, but also safe outcomes. Mm -hmm. What we know now with IVL, of course, is that there's no safety price to pay. Yes. So, you know, you add the no safety price plus the efficacy benefits that we're seeing, mm -hmm. then it really is a great option where you're not getting a good response up front. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's really valuable. And I think the area we're moving into now is that understanding of nodular calcium. You know, how do we understand the nodule? 
How do we get full deformation of the nodule? How do we get concentric stent results? But where we are now is an understanding that the MSA is king when it comes to durability. Mm -hmm. So even if you do deform the nodule but get a good area, we know that's going to give the patient a durable response, which is what it's all after, of course. Absolutely. And do you find that now that this data has started to come out, has this altered your calcium modification algorithm, for example? Where do you fit IVL into your calcium modification algorithm? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the first way to address that is what is the threshold of care for calcium-specific therapy? Because, um, you know, below a certain threshold, calcium is, is, is in the vessel, but it's not making a real impact on vascular compliance, and it's probably not going to limit stent expansion. Mm. So we know there's a couple of scoring systems out there which will tell us when calcium matters. And I think they have been targeted to a degree on concentric calcium before, but they still apply. Mm -hmm. Larger volumes of calcium, longer lengths of calcium, deeper thicknesses of calcium. And in those scenarios, we're using IVL for first-line therapy in terms of calcium-specific therapy. Mm -hmm. The only exception to that would be, I would say, where you've got very high-grade lesions. And rotational atherectomy in these very high-grade lesions is a, it's a great way to behave uh, or to pave the way to secondary therapy. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you're building an algorithm, what you're really trying to do with your, to your communication to physicians is give this mental roadmap mm -hmm. what's most likely to work the first time. And that improves efficiency. And you can't build that roadmap without on the foundation of safety. Mm -hmm. So certainly in my clinical practice, I've been very impressed with the safety profile. And I think previously the limitations of IVL would say, well, okay, if it's very long disease, how am I going to cope with all this long disease? Mm -hmm. So the C2 plus with the extra 50% yes. of pulses is definitely a help in that respect. So I don't have to compromise or take two or three balloons with the economic downside of that. I can treat longer section of disease and still get good results for patients. Yes, and it is a re in the space of five years, we've already seen our second iterations of the, of the IVL balloons. It's really impressive and it has met a clinical need, I would think. Do you, do you think that at the C2 Plus? For, for sure. And I think also, I think it's opened our eyes into what we're treating on a pathological level in a way that we didn't really have before. It was a little bit like sticking our head in the interventional sand. Mm -hmm. We knew there was a problem there, but we didn't have a solution. So let's pretend there isn't a problem. Uh, I also think that for IVL specifically, having an imaging-based practice tells you when to treat, how effective your treatment is, and after you put your stent in, how durable that response is for your patient so you can have some confidence that you've done a good job. And actually on that point, I mean, there will be a lot of people who are early career uh, watching this. And in terms of calcium modification, you mentioned that imaging really is essential in, in order to ensure that you get a, a good result. But what exactly is a good result? What are you looking for when you're doing calcium modification on, uh, on a patient? Um, for yeah, example? I mean, again, it's a great question because what you're talking is what is your goal of intervention? And too often we define that goal by our individual self. I've got a great angiographic result, yeah. aren't I the hero? You know, but actually what we're doing is taking away that anginal burden or treating that acute coronary syndrome for a patient who will then have a durable long-term result. And we know there's a very strong relationship between the imaging-based results in terms of how big the stent is, mm -hmm. but also our risk of acute complications like stent thrombosis are going to be much lower with a well-expanded stent and a non-diseased damaged vessel. So I think having a goal for therapy drives good outcomes, and we saw that in the ultimate study, mm -hmm. where even setting the goal shifted the bars. And it makes sense, because you think, well, I'm going to practice darts. I'm just going to take the dart. I'm going to chuck it at the wall, and look how good I am at throwing darts. Yeah. <laughs> Without a target, yes. nobody knows how good you are at throwing yeah. darts. Mm -hmm. So the imaging is, in your like, as well as it guides safety, it's our target. Without a target, you're not going to get to your goal. And that's what you teach your fellows to treat to target and with the, in terms of intercoronary imaging outcomes? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's appropriate as of intervention. We need to know what we're trying to achieve. So we treat the right patients. And of course, we use physiology to guide who are the right patients, who are likely to get benefit. We assess the lesion very carefully with imaging, whether it's IVUS or OCT. We understand the need for plaque modification, whether that's with standard balloons or IVL and heavy calcium. Mm -hmm. And then after we put a stent in, we make sure it's well expanded and it's appropriately sized to the vessel. Mm -hmm. Now, when I tell that to 
somebody in my family who's not medical, they say, well, that, that sounds pretty obvious. Yeah. And it is pretty obvious. Yes, absolutely. But why does it not happen more frequently? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's about education and this type of forum is, is, is absolutely essential for that. And, and I think IVL has done a really good job in, do, in, in pushing that agenda and sort of teaching people how to um, approach calcium modification and uh, how to check your results, I guess. Yeah, very much so. And I think also it's, it's enabled us to understand the limitations of our historic ways of treating calcium or even treating coronary disease. Mm -hmm. We use a, a luminogram, an angiogram, if you like, and that's not very good at detecting calcium. So that's a limitation. It's also not very good at sizing stents. Mm -hmm. And that's a limitation as well. So I think IVL has been a great example of how to integrate complex procedures and make them more simple by making them systematic. Mm -hmm. And I, th I actually think external to interventional cardiology, physicians, patients would be horrified to think there's this massive variability in care. Yeah. There isn't really a need for it. You know, we're all tr should be aligned onto the same goals. Mm -hmm. and I think the more we're systematic in how we analyze and treat and assess our stent implantation, the more likely we are to close the gap with surgery in, in complex disease. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I suppose a, our group in, in Madrid, when I was there as a fellow, we, we published some data on follow-up angiography in these patients and actually OCT assessment. And I suppose we're, we're quite used to seeing these IVL images on OCTs, probably more commonly, where we see this deep fissuring, this deep fracturing. Um, and what we saw at follow-up angiography is that actually all of that is, is really very healed um, and that you get a nice stent coverage. Have you had a chance to do follow-up angiograms on any of your IVL patients? Have you had um, is this something that you've noticed in your practice that the, the healing, the, the vascular healing or the neointimal healing is, um, is good after IVL? Or? Yeah, so I would say within the NHS, they're not, we're not that keen in expanding follow-up procedures in, okay. in a kind of non-clinical scenario. And I think that is one of the really good areas where research can close those gaps. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody's clinically well, the probability of them getting a follow-up angiogram is low. Yes. Um, but I remember a few years ago when IVL came out, first of all, we did put in that surveillance angiogram in place because mm -hmm. we didn't know what the healing response was really? like. And yeah. as you say, when you look at the, the, the OCT or the IVUS and you see the fractures, mm -hmm. you think, well, is that associated with um, an exaggerated healing response? Yes. But you know, the research is very reassuring in that respect. It doesn't seem to be. Yes, it is very reassuring. We, the, certainly the study that we did and the OCT follow-ups that we had, there was um, very good uh, vascular healing and uh, stent strut coverage, etc. So it's kind of quite promising um, results. So what's next for IVL? Where, or what's next for calcium modification in general? Where do we go from here? Yeah, I'd say the hard bits that we're left with is understanding the threshold of care for eccentric calcium. When do we need to bring out the big guns? When do we need to target eccentric calcium? When does it matter to stent expansion? And nodular calcium. And nodular calcium is still a bit of a mystery. We can see what it looks like at the tip of the iceberg, but we can't see what the, it, it's comprised of. So we don't know if that iceberg is going to crumble with balloon inflation. We don't need if it needs shaved with rotation atherectomy or we don't know, understand if it needs to be crumbled or fractured with IVL. So I think, you know, kudos to Shockwave for investing in this kind of research, because without the information we have to date, we're not going to be able to solve these problems. But if you look back five years and see where we've come from, yeah. massive progress and uh, exciting times ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Exciting times ahead. I think we have a lot more to learn, but it is very exciting and the research is ongoing. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for joining me today. I think it's been a pleasure. really great session and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your EuroPCR 2023. Thanks, Angela. Thank Take you. care.